This is uh, for my first hour class on March 28th. Anyway, uh, the Germans carried out a lot of atrocities. Uh, they did many of the same things that you're reading about today that Vladimir Putin is doing in, in um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, they burned towns to the ground. They slaughtered six, in the first five days of the invasion, they slaughtered 6,000 Belgians, men, women, and children. Um, and, uh, you know, that, again, made the Germans look like the Huns, the bad guys. And you're getting a real lesson in this today, right now, when you look at uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, one of the big problems. And by the way, uh, the latest thing, just to update you on the uh, war in the Ukraine, is that the, uh, you know, it seemed like the capital of the country was going to fall to Russian troops, but the um, Ukrainian people have rallied and they have pushed the Russians back 35 miles. Uh, they're going to probably shove them out of that country, cautiously optimistic. And of course, the whole world is aiding them, uh, the Ukrainians, because they're the good guys. The next time somebody says, oh, you know, we're the United States and we're big and bad and powerful, we can do whatever we want. It doesn't make any difference what anybody thinks. Think of the Ukraine. Uh, because it does make a difference. And it made a difference in 1914 as well. Uh, the Germans look like the bad guys. And one of the dumbest moves that the Germans made, get this down, is that they executed a British Army nurse. And right there she is. She's the older. You know, most of these nurses are younger women. But that's the older. Uh, she's the older woman. She was in charge of these nurses in Belgium. You know, as the British and French are being pushed back by the Germans, she was there. Her name was Edith. You have her name down, Edith Cavell. Yeah, Edith Cavell. And uh, she courageously volunteered to stay. The, the, the British were being pushed back so, uh, the British were being pushed back so uh, rapidly that uh, they couldn't uh, transport all their wounded. So she and a group of nurses, a very courageous thing to do, they volunteered to stay behind and treat the wounded British soldiers. Uh, and she did that. She helped nurse them back to health, but she also uh, helped them escape. Get that down. She was helping British soldiers escape. And the Germans caught her. And they lined her up in front of a wall and shot her. <clears throat> now, we live in a different age to a degree today. Uh, but anyone that raised a, I'll just be real simple about this. Anyone that raised a hand to a woman was considered to be the lowest of the lowest of the low. You know? And I still say to you today, gentlemen, you don't strike a woman. You just don't do it. That's the ultimate coward right there. You don't strike a woman. And, and I say to you, ladies, don't let some idiot hit you. <clears throat> anyway, uh, but certainly, you know, two years before they shot her, the Titanic went down. The Titanic sank. And on that ship, and, you know, this is another topic for another day, but one of the rules was women and children first. And there were men who stepped back from the lifeboats. They could have gotten in. They stepped back from the lifeboats, and they let women and children take their place. And they drowned. They gave their lives rather than get in those boats before women. Um, you know, they held them in such high regard. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, to strike a woman, you were the lowest of the low. Well, they shot this woman. Okay, They should have sent her back to a prison camp. They should have exchanged her between the lines. They should have done a lot of things, but they shot a woman. And again, this just adds to this idea that the Germans were the Huns. They were the barbarians. They were trying to destroy civilization. And the British and the French play this, uh, that we are the ones defending civilization. What we're talking about is why, even though Wilson said that the United States was neutral, why most Americans supported the Allies. And that's one of the reasons. And also get this down, and we've talked about this, and I'm just going to say this real quick. Uh, the war was good for the U.S. economy. The war was good for before we know we don't get in for the first three years and we sell weapons to both sides. And when the war is over, this country is going to enter into the uh, greatest uh, economic boom in its history up until that point, in the roaring 20s. In other words, we were literally the merchants of death. We sold weapons to both sides. One American, this is an American newspaper, wrote this in 1915. And I quote, 10,000 German widows, 10,000 German orphans bear the legend made in America, end quote, made in America. The United States loaned billions of dollars to the allied nations, loaned, uh, and, we were, and we were the only nation to profit financially from this war. Well, meanwhile, then, the German uh, invasion is stopped. 
Uh, both sides dig in here along that line you see right there. That's the Western Front. Again, that's where most of the fighting and dying in Europe took place. Most of the people in Europe killed in World War I. Uh, that's where they're going to die. Uh, and I want you to understand that, that these trenches, there's an artist drawing. Uh, here's uh, these trenches were uh, uh, elaborate things. Uh, I'm not just talking about a little hole in the ground. Um, here's the, you know, here would be, here would be the front line of the German there would be the German trenches, the beginning of them, and here would be the British or the American or the French trenches. You would have the front line. They would be connected to trenches by the second line. Here might be reinforcements. The third line might have artillery in it. The fourth line might be a hospital trench. The fifth line might be a kitchen trench where the food was prepared every day and taken up to the front line. And, of course, the Germans, you see this right here is what I'm trying to show you. Uh, and the Germans had an elaborate series of trenches as well. Out in front, they had huge scrolls of barbed wire, not the kind of barbed wire you see on your fence out in your pasture. Yes. Like uh, prison barbed wire? Yes, that's yeah. exactly, you know, yeah. What do they call it? Razor wire? Yeah. yeah. Razor wire. These had barbs on them. I don't know. These had barbs on them that long, you know, and one of the most dangerous jobs was, the, and the Germans, they have that out in front of their trenches. And uh, that, that's good, yeah, the razor wire. And if this side attacked, one of the most dangerous jobs in World War I, they had these guys with wire cutters, and they had to go out ahead of the attack under fire and cut the wire. They'd try and cut the wire so the other side could get through. And this out here in the middle, got this, you know, maybe from here to where 4C cement, cement used to be. I can't remember what the name of it is today, but anyway, 4C cement. Here would be the British trenches, maybe a little further back. Maybe, maybe uh, to the red light on Main Street, uh, the bank of Eufaula down to Four Seas. And this area out in the middle, get this down, was called no man's land, okay? No man's land. And the way the war was fought is that weeks would go by and not much would happen. Weeks would go by and not much would happen. And all of a sudden, the British artillery would open up blasting and bombarding the German trenches. And that might go on for two or three days. And you just hunkered down in those trenches. And by the way, when I talk about these trenches, you had to have a ladder to get out of them. Okay, that's how deep they are. I'm going to show you a little film clip. Have any of you seen the movie War Horse? Have you seen that? Well, you ought to watch it. I think it's pretty good. It's got a storyline, but I mean, you learn a lot about World War I and you're watching it. But uh, anyway, uh, those trenches were as deep as this ceiling is here. And they were this wide. And uh, they had a wooden floor, you know, they, and look, they've got underground bunkers, underground command posts, underground hospitals, underground ammunition, you name it. Uh, and, and men just dug in for four years on both sides and they lived like gophers, you know, down there. Uh, but they would fire for two or three days and then all of a sudden a whistle would blow and somebody write this phrase down would yell over the top over the top and they would take those ladders and they would crawl out and they would go marching across no man's land like this thousands of them okay um and the and, and the germans would open up with machine guns and slaughter them and they would be killed by the thousands never make it to the german lines they would be thrown back in and then two or three weeks later the germans would open up and they would bombard the british and they would go over the top and they would attack the British and the British machine gunners would slaughter them. Uh, and it went on that way for four years and neither side ever achieved a breakthrough. This war was, and when I say it was an unnecessary war that should have never been fought, it's absolutely horrible. That's a real World War I trench there. You can kind of see the size of them there. Looks like that's been shelled quite a bit. Uh, there are some men, World War I soldiers going over the top. Looks like British. There, there's some guys running through the barbed wire. That's an actual attack of World War I soldiers. There's a man being hit. He's already going forward. His helmet's falling off, and he's being shot. Okay. There's a trench. Not a very good one, but there it is. And there's some dead, uh, I think those are dead Germans. I think those are dead Germans. 
Another problem is, is it rained all the time, and that's why they put those wooden planks down there, but men stood in mud for four years. And you know what happened? Even despite the fact they're wearing pretty good leather boots, the mud would eventually seep through. You're just standing there, standing there, standing there, and uh, uh, you got a thing called trench foot. And trench foot, your feet will swell up the size of footballs, and there's only one thing they can do, cut them off. And that's why in London and Berlin, in New York City, all over the world, uh, you saw young men, 19, 20 years old, in from the war, and they were, they didn't have any feet. Trench foot, uh, deadly. If they didn't cut your feet off, it would cause a blood infection, it'd kill you. So people were standing on street corners on crutches, not much older than you, prime of life. There's the number one killer right there. That's a World War One machine gun. That's responsible. Yeah, write that down. That's responsible. Most of the deaths in World War One from that right there. There are other weapons as well. By the way, there are the trenches today. They're still there. Okay, there's the trenches today. And I don't know if I told you this, but be careful if you go over there touring because hardly a 10-year period goes by that there isn't some tourist walking along and he hits a mine from World War One and blows him up. Okay. Uh, all the shells from World War One are not yet exploded, okay? Hardly a 10-year, hardly a decade goes by that there isn't some French farmer or some Belgian farmer or some German farmer out there tilling his, where the old Western Front used to be, tilling his vineyard on a tractor and his disc will hit an unexploded mine and boil him out a tractor and all. Okay? So isn't that something? World War One's 104 years ago. People are still dying from the shells fired in World War One. In a sense, it's never gone away. Uh, there are a couple of Americans. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, these soldiers, like I say, they marched upright. By the way, these machine guns, their range was two to 3,000 yards. They could start killing you 3,000 3, yards uh, away. That's 30 football fields. If you want to, 30 football fields away, you came under fire. And at first, when these men go over the top, they displayed no fear. You know, they just, you know, they were going to show the enemy they weren't afraid. So they go shoulder to shoulder. Some British army officers refused to carry weapons. They just said, I'm going to take my walking stick. You know, the popular thing in those days, walking sticks, kind of like hoodies today are popular. Well, walking sticks, young men, they didn't need it because they were old and decrepit. They just had a walking stick. That was the cool thing to do. And these young officers just said, we're going to walk right across with uh, just a walking stick. One British regiment, you know, the national sport of England is, well, the national sport of Europe is football, what we call soccer. Uh, and when they went over the top the first time to show the Germans how little they feared them, they kicked a soccer ball back and forth between the ranks. It's like they were out on the field playing a game of football. And, of course, they all got shot down and killed. They only did that once. Uh, let me show you this thing from Warhorse real quick. If I can get this to work, I think mean, this is an excellent, uh, excellent uh, Hollywood occasionally does something right. I just does this. Okay, you can you can see you can see a lot about the uniforms and and the trenches. And this is this is this is a British Army charge in a battle we'll talk about in a little while called the Battle of the Somme. So this tells you a lot, a lot about the war. Nobody to treat him today.
move that type of competition. So uh, that's that's an example of what I'm talking about. And by the way, uh, they didn't remove the dead body. I mean, they couldn't. That's occasionally they tried, but they really couldn't remove a lot of the dead bodies, and so they just stayed out there and rotted. And it bred a gigantic race of rats, okay? These rats come out there and, and eat these dead bodies for three and a half years. Uh, and the stench, of course, must have been horrible. You're sitting in this trench, but they are, you know, you have all of these uh, decaying, decaying bodies. So neither side wins, neither side accomplishes anything. And, and an entire generation of young men on all sides, German, Austrian, Russian, uh, British, uh, and the French, and German, and later on Americans, uh, are slaughtered for no uh, good reason. Uh, in fact, it doesn't take long, get this down, for the war on the Western Front to turn into a stalemate. That means there's all kind of killings going on, but neither side can get the advantage. Neither side, neither side is winning. Also, get this down, uh, both armies were completely unprepared for the weapons of mass destruction. There had never been weapons like this in a war. Uh, introduced by the Industrial Revolution. One of the things was gas. Here you see it, these are Americans, and they, they, they've even got gas masks for their mules, okay? The first, gas was first used by the Germans. By the way, it's so deadly that after the war in 1923, there's going to be a Geneva conference. The nations of the world get together, and they outlaw certain things in warfare, and that still holds to this day. Gas is one of them, okay? One of the things they're worried about that Putin might do uh, if he begins to lose this war in a major way is that he might use chemical weapons. They're talking about gas. That's, that's illegal, okay? Uh, but uh, they have two types of gas, mustard gas uh, and chlorine gas. <clears throat> mustard gas just choked you to death, okay? It just choked you to death. Uh, chlorine gas, however... I think it's chlorine. Uh, no, wait a minute. Maybe chlorine choked you to death. Uh, I got to get my gas right here. But one of them, I think maybe mustard gas, if you inhaled it, you know, you're all young and healthy and your lungs are in better shape than they'll ever be. But uh, if you inhale just a little bit of this mustard gas, it would be like taking your lungs, uh, the lungs of uh, your lungs as healthy as you are and throwing them on a barbecue grill for 45 minutes, okay? Just in a matter of minutes, that would happen. Your lungs would look like the lungs of somebody who smoked uh, three packs of Lucky Strikes a day for 50 years, okay? That's how quickly it, des it destroyed you. Uh, so those, and, and the first time that gas was used was at a battle called Ypres, okay? Write that down, Ypres in 1915. It's another World War I battle. I'm probably never going to ask you about when was gas used for the first time. But I want to, as we go through this, mention these battles. So someday if you're in class, they might mention the Battle of the Marne or Ypres or Verdun or the Somme, you know, that they're related to World War I. But uh, the Germans fired that at a group of Canadians. There were Canadians. They were part of the British Empire, or the British Commonwealth by that time. But anyway, they were there fighting for the British. And, uh, the, you know, they never had seen this. And all of a sudden, they fire these gas canisters. And when they hit the ground, they kind of bounce. And then they start hissing. And this blackish, greenish, grayish smoke starts coming out. They don't know what it is. But they see that smoke uh, start engulfing their troops. And if you're back here, you see your men starting all of a sudden to cough and bend over and fall on the ground, choking. And they didn't know what it was. And they certainly didn't know what to do. But there was one officer there. And I guess he had paid attention in chemistry class because he took his handkerchief out, and he urinated in it, and he held that over his nose. I see some of you going, oh, you're, well, you know, what's the other option? Uh, death, okay, yeah, I think a little, you know, breathing in a little pee, you know, in, in the severest death, that's just my opinion, but anyway, he put the wrong, human urine has ammonia in it, and ammonia acted as a filter for gas, and of course, after that, both sides I said, what did, I asked in one class, I said, what did both, they said they passed out handkerchiefs. No, both sides start developing the gas mask. And here you see uh, troops in World War I uh, gas mask, okay? Uh, gassing also caused blindness. You have a lot of blind young men. That's by um, a British artist. Uh, I think his name was R. Sergeant Singer, Singer, Sanger. Anyway, Singer. Uh, and that's in the Imperial War Museum, I think, in London. 
And uh, there you see them, you know, blind men and there are others on the ground waiting to be lined up. But uh, a gas attack has happened and they've got their arm on the man ahead of them stumbling back to a medical aid station. One of the uh, great uh, paintings that shows the horror of World War I. So uh, there are a lot of young men that go off to war, uh, not much older than you, some of them your age actually, and uh, they come back from the war blinded, okay? Tanks, write this down. The very first tanks in warfare were used in World War I. We'll come back to these guys. There, there's a World War I tank. Uh, the reason the tanks are called tanks and they couldn't break through the line. And, and they, they don't develop these until pretty late into the war. Uh, but they got through the lines. They managed to make a few little breakthroughs. If they'd have had these at the first of the war, the British might have won the war. The reason the tank is called a tank is because they were building them in London, which is in the southern part of England. Uh, and they knew there were German spies all over the place. And they didn't want the German spies to find out about this new wonder weapon they were creating. They would send them up to Scotland, out to the Scottish highlands in this desolate area to test them out. Uh, but they knew they had to ship them by train, and they knew the train stations would be full of German spies. Well, of course, in World War I, the cavalry, the horse cavalry, is still around. So to disguise these tanks on these trains, uh, they would put them in big wooden crates, and they would stamp water tank on it to make the Germans think, ah, those are just water tanks for horses, when in reality they were tanks. And so this weapon right here became known as the tank, and the first time it's used, is uh, in World War One, and it did. They did manage to make a few breakthroughs. There's a modern day tank, a little bit different. Okay, there's a modern day tank. Also, write this down: the airplane. This is the first war in which the airplane is used, and uh, there's a world. That's an RAF. That's British. If that was in color. That would be that circle would be red, white, and blue. You see, he's got his machine gun up there. Uh, planes have been around since the Wright brothers in 1903. Uh, but this is the first time they're used in warfare. And of course, they were much better developed than the flyer that had flown at Kitty Hawk had been. Uh, get these down. These pilots, these World War I pilots, they were the most heroic figures of the war. People were just amazed by these guys that flew. Uh, they're kind of viewed like astronauts. They, uh, World War I pilots were kind of viewed the same way we view astronauts. They wore these leather caps. Uh, and they would have a long silk scarf that their wife or their girlfriend had made for them back home and sent them over there, and it was sort of fluttering the wind as they flew. And get this down, they engaged the enemy, the Germans, and, and, and dogfights, okay? The World War I is the war of dogfights. Of course, it's a new weapon, and they had to iron out the kinks. One of the first problems they had was uh, that they didn't... Uh, synchronize, they didn't synchronize the propeller with the machine gun firing, okay? So the first few guys that went into combat, here would go a German plane, and here's a British pilot zeroing in on him, and he starts firing, and he shot off his own propeller and crashed to the ground. So they had to, you know, go back to the drawing board and synchronize the propeller so they could, the bullets could fire through it, you know, which they took care of that little problem. But there you see the guy's got a machine gun. Uh, that is, uh, you know, Red Baron pizza. If any of you eaten Red Baron pizza, if you look on the Red Baron pizza, there's a guy with a leather cap. He's got a scarf on. They've got a World War One pilot on there. This is a, a this is not a World War One plane, but it's a replica of a World War One plane. It's got a lot of red on it because one of the most famous uh, pilots of World War One, in fact, the most famous uh, pilot of World War One. I, I want you to write his name down. Uh, was um, Manfred, let's see if I've got a picture of him. There he is, write it down. Baron, that was his title, but Manfred von Richtenhofen, Richtenhofen okay? Baron von Richtenhofen, that's not German enough for you. He was an ace, got this down. To be an ace, to be an ace, you had to fire, actually you had to kill, uh, shoot down 21 enemy planes. 21 enemy planes, and of course he did that and more. In fact, he shot down 80. It's a pretty good record. And of course, uh, you know, uh, everybody knew about the, and dreaded and feared the Red Baron, as he was called, because he got this down, he painted his plane red. Okay, this were the title for Red Baron. There really was a Red Baron, but he painted his plane red so that the enemy could see it and know it was him. 
And of course, everybody was out to shoot down the Red, the Red Baron. But he almost survived the war. In 1918, just a few weeks before the war ends, he was flying up the Somme River Valley. He had shot down 80 planes. He was going for number 81. He was tailing a British plane about to shoot it down. And an Australian soldier down in the trenches. And by the way, these guys don't fight very high up in the sky. Not much higher than the lights out there on the football field. So if you were a good shot, you could pick them off with a rifle. Um, you know, to drop bombs, they carried their bombs in a basket, and they kind of balanced that between their knees, and then they just flew around and just sort of looked. This is an open cockpit, and they would see a trench and drop it. And that got pretty pesky, so if you've got a rifle, you'd shoot the guy down. So uh, they flew around. They challenged each other to duels. A, a, a British pilot would send word over through the lines to the Germans and say, I'm going to be up above no man's land tomorrow at 4 o'clock, and I challenge you to a duel. And a German pilot would come out, and they would fly around with pistols shooting at each other, okay, up there in the air. But anyway, von Richthofen was the Red Baron, if you want to call him that. He was flying up the Somme River Valley, and uh, he was following a British plane, and an Australian soldier shot him down, shot him right through the heart, killed him. He was only 25 years old. The most famous, the most famous pilot of World War One, the most famous ace of World War One. I. I hope by this point you can identify World. Listen, I hope by this point you can identify World War One by its weaponry. If you ever hear of anyone talking about a war that had trench warfare and machine guns and mustard gas and over the top and flying aces and no man's land, that's one war. That's World War. That's World World War One. We also had an ace in the war. I want you to write his name down. Uh, who shot down 21 planes, and there he is in his airplane. You look, you can see his machine guns there, okay? He's double barrel loaded his machine guns, and there's his prop. Uh, but uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, write him down. Eddie Rickenbacker. There he is, Eddie Rickenbacker. He shot down 21 planes, and then they brought him home, and he went around and made speeches to kind of build up morale. Eddie Rickenbacker, okay? Well, uh, after your quiz, we'll take it up there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I do. 